get started? Sure. Yeah. Whatever you think. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this final Washington History Seminar session for uh, this semester. Um, great to see so many of you and to have so many of you uh, join us for our uh, talk uh, by our um, featured speaker, Konrad Jarosch, um, Roger Lewis. Um, my co-chair is uh, off to uh, uh, Oxford. Uh, so I have the pleasure of having uh, Arnita Jones, who was there at the uh, present at the creation of this seminar, um, the former director of the uh, AHA, uh, join us for, uh, uh, for this session on behalf of the National History Center, which of course is the co-sponsor of this session. We have the pleasure of, uh, the privilege of uh, having with us today um, and the Wilson Center has had him with us for the whole semester. Konrad Jarausch, he is a distinguished scholar here at the Center in Residence and the Lurcy Professor of European Civilization at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's also a senior fellow at the Zentrum für Zeithistorische Forschung in Potsdam, Germany. He uh, served as co-director of the UNC Duke Center for European Studies and also as the director for the Zentrum für Zeithistorische Studien, one of the most important research centers in Germany um, uh, on contemporary history in Potsdam. Starting with Hitler's seizure of power in the First World War, um, his research interests have moved on to social history of German students and professions, German unification in 1989-90, about which he will speak today, as well as uh, historiography under communist uh, Germany, the nature of East German dictatorship, and the debate about historians and the Third Reich. He has been concerned with the problems of interpreting 20th century German history and European history. That's what he's been working on here at the center for the last few months, the issue of cultural democratization and the relationship between Honecker and Brezhnev. He has authored, co-edited, co-authored, edited over 40 books on German and European history, including Shattered Past, Reconstructing German Histories, After Hitler, Recivilizing um, uh, Germans, 1945 to 1995, 1955, 1945, 45, 45, 95, right. The Rush to German Unity, and most recently, Reluctant Accomplice, German, Good Germans in the War of Annihilation, 1939 to 1942, which is comprised of wartime letters written by Konrad's father, who served in the reserve battalion in a reserve battalion of Hitler's army in Poland and Russia. He holds PhDs, uh, a PhD from and an MA in German history from the University of Wisconsin, and he's truly one of the giants in European and German history uh, in this country. And so we're absolutely delighted to have him here today with us. Uh, he's also been a partner in crime on all sorts of uh, Cold War endeavors, including uh, he's the driving force behind an effort to um, uh, establish a Cold War museum at Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin. Some of you may have uh, noticed some of the press coverage in recent months on the subject. Uh, he's here today to talk about the Berlin Republic, German unification 25 years later. Conrad. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Christian. Um, there are a couple of cliches with which one can start uh, at this point. Uh, one of them is the best for last, and the other one is another German one, which says that the person at the end will be bitten by the dogs. Uh, and you can decide after the presentation <laughs> which of these two things might apply. Um, it's been a quarter of a century since the uh, overthrow of communism, which seems kind of amazing uh, by now. Um, I will have a kind of uh, Stone Age PowerPoint <laughs> that is some text and a few pictures in between. This is the celebration of the Day of German Unity on October 3rd, 1990. And of course, it was an enormous surprise because uh, most people did not expect the wall to open in the fall of, speak up a little more. Okay, 
um, in the fall of 1989, and then within one year, uh, the East-West Division to be overcome, the Cold War, the Iron Curtain to be lifted, and German unification to happen. That didn't seem to be something that was on uh, tap in our lifetime. Now, uh, in order to provide a little bit more substantive reflection on this, uh, I have put together an interdisciplinary international and, and interpretive retrospective on the results of German unification. There are tons of books by now on the process itself and lots of memoirs and so on, but there is still a debate about the Berlin Republic, um, a mixture of hope and fear related to the movement of the capital from the nice university town in Bonn, a small town in Germany, according to John Le Carre, those of you who are reading spy fiction. <laughs> You know, and then, of course, you have multiple Berlins, different incarnations ranging all the way from the Hohenzollerns uh, and Prussian militarism to Weimar culture and, uh, you know, innovation uh, uh, and experimentation and so on. Um, what I did in the volume is contrast three different views. Um, the East German view tends to see problems because it deals, of course, with the shock uh, of the disappearance of a state. Uh, this is also fairly unique. I'm not sure how many other examples there are uh, other than countries getting conquered, but countries that abol abolish themselves, you know, that is, I think, a political science challenge you know, out there. And Easterners see, tend to see more problems. The Westerners see more successes. Uh, and so I have an essay by, on five different dimensions by an Easterner, by a Westerner. And then I asked an Anglo-American scholar to kind of create somewhat reason in the debate, that is, to mediate. And of course, these Anglo-American scholars sometimes have more sympathy for the East and sometimes more for the West and stuff, and so this is not boring. But what I will not do is uh, talk about the specific essays. I'll try to give you the gist. Uh, this is easier than we don't have to read the whole uh, manuscript. The book will come out this summer. So those of you who want to check up on me whether I represent these folks correctly can do so you know, once it's there. The internal German discussion is all about inner unity, innere Einheit, but fortunately that has fallen by the wayside largely by now because it's a fact. It's happened and however unified it is or disunified, uh, for those of us who teach in the South, you know, uh, I was corrected in my first lecture when I talked about the Civil War in front of 200 kids. <laughs> Somebody piped up and said, sir, that's the South. Professor, <laughs> the war between the states. <laughs> You know, so uh, you know in American history also the difficulties of when there is a split and what happens whether or not parts you know, come together as they, some people think they should uh, or they don't. Um, how to measure internal unity is one of the issues. And of course the transformation is asymmetrical uh, because it largely uh, touched upon the East because that's the system that abolished itself. There was a winner and there was a loser, which of course has made it difficult for there to be a unification of gleicher Augenhöhe is the German cliche that is, you know, on the same eye level, you know, not one looking down upon the other, and I will get to that in uh, a moment. What I want to do is a preliminary balance sheet. Uh, this just shows you some of the pieces. Uh, 57 because of the Tsar. On the left edge of the top thing, that little thing, is the Saarland in 56. It decided to rejoin uh, Germany, although it should have stayed in France because, you know, we all know that God lives in France and uh, you know, life is much nicer there. Uh, and then the little thing in the middle is Berlin, and then to the right is what is called East Germany. And what's not on the map is what fortunately did not get reunified, namely the former eastern provinces. Um, okay, now let me, that was just sort of for the geographers uh, among you. 
Now, the five uh, uh, dimensions that I want to talk about very briefly is number one, the transfer of institutions, number two, the economic crisis, number three, the social upheaval, number four, the cultural conflict, and number five, implications for foreign policy, this being Washington. Uh, that is perhaps the point that interests you more than uh, the others. The transfer of institutions, in my mind, was largely successful since the redemocratization had begun already in the GDR uh, during the peaceful revolution. Because when people rise up from below and have mass demonstrations culminating in about 500,000 people at the Berlin Alexanderplatz in early November 1989, um, then that is a process of democratization because folks overcome the fear and they begin to speak publicly. They have witty slogans and um, things which they shout, and we will get there in a moment too, and so on. So, you know, it's a gradual reappropriation of uh, democracy. And then, of course, you have Western development aid people, um, you know, a daughter and husband of a cousin of my wife is <laughs> are in Thuringia working as lawyers for the Ministry of Justice there. They come from Bavaria, and they didn't stay in Bavaria, but they went, you know, to the east. So. There are examples of this. Some of these folks were, of course, uh, you know, uh, out to make a buck quickly, but some of them also came for reasons of idealism. Now, according to paragraph 23, and that's the reason why I mentioned the Tsar, uh, the GDR was divided into five new states, which had existed in 1952 and then had been centralized in the administrative district. So there is a return of federalism, and it is not the GDR as state, but it is five new federal states that join the already existing 11 or 12 or whatever uh, federal states. Um, and that involves, of course, the reconstruction of state government, administrations, courts, schools, and so on, but on the Western pattern, because it was the East German population that wanted the Western pattern. And so what happened to them is that they went to bed on October 2nd, and they woke up on October 3rd, or the other way around, on the 3rd and the 4th. And you know, they woke up in a different country, you know, although they didn't move physically. And they were not conquered. They did this themselves, you know, so. Uh, the political parties unified relatively quickly because of the election campaign in the spring of 1990 already. Uh, there was a, you know, uh, Block Partei, the CDU, which is a kind of an Eastern version of the Western one that was subordinate to the communists, and they are the ones that actually then ended up winning. There was an independent social democratic party with initials. It's not a typo. I will have some typos in there, but this is not the typo. <laughs> you know, and it was SDP, you know, that then merged with the SPD of West Germany. And there was a liberal group that was absorbed into the FDP. And um, the various dissident groups in Bündnis 90 got together in a difficult kind of marriage with the Greens because the Greens didn't really like unification. They didn't want unification. Therefore, they lost the election, the next federal election. And the joke about this one was that it's the Eastern dissidents with a special election clause that made it into the Bundestag. Otherwise, the Greens would have been out of there. Uh, and then, of course, there are the communist successors, the PDS, Partei des Demokratischen Sozialismus, which have now merged with some Western inveterate that haven't quite figured out yet that Marxism has died, you know, into something called Die Linke, you know. Uh, so you now have an all German five party system. And of course, at the same time, the trade unions, the employers associations, the churches, the sports clubs, civil society groups, and after a long time, even the pen club in Germany. The writers were some of the latest, uh, the last ones, you know, uh, to merge. So these institutional transfers and mergers worked fairly well. There you have the asymmetry uh, of unification. Helmut Kohl you know, is a fairly sizable person, a man of considerable stature, <laughs> uh, and I can elaborate further on this. Uh, and the other one that hangs you know, from the uh, 
seal officially is Lothar de Maizière, you know, the last uh, prime minister of the GDR. Now, nonetheless, even in politics, there were a series of problems because, as I said, it was not a merger of equals since the GDR dissolved itself. Moreover, East Germans are permanently in a minority because there are fewer of them. It's not that they are physically necessarily smaller. Um, and, you know, that means that anything that is a national organization always has a quarter of Easterners in it, which means that a quarter rarely outvotes the majority. Only in Washington is this done. <laughs> I will not elaborate on this any further. You know, as a result, you know, uh, they had to take over the Western uh, rule structure, the Western bureaucracies, the Western institutions, also in higher education, uh, which in some cases really did not fit. Um, the advantage is that they're ready-made. I mean, unlike in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and other places where they had to reinvent everything from scratch, you know, there they had a system into which they could step, and you know, after a few days, you know, it could function. As a result, of course, there are few leading East Germans successful in national politics, and the exception, of course, proves the rule because the chancellor is now Angela Merkel from East Germany, uh, and you know jo Joachim Gauck, the last name on the list there, is the federal president. Uh, but in general, there is a deficit of Eastern elites, and that is one of the reasons why the East Germans still feel that they are politically second-class uh, citizens. Moreover, their relationship to democracy is somewhat more instrumental because uh, they're still asking the question that was being asked in West Germany in the 1950s, namely, you know, what does it do for me? Uh, what has it done for me lately? Uh, because they are still more interested in equality as a, in heritage of socialism uh, than in personal freedom. Um, and that, for that reason, political culture is still somewhat fragile, uh, but, um, you know, that is ultimately, compared to some other dimensions, actually one of the success stories. So this is a success minus, is what I would say here. Now let's go to the next one, and these people in suits are some of the first minister presidents, and you know those of you who have met them here at the Wilson Center, uh, you know Biedenkopf is the second one from the right, a professor of economics, and Diepgen is the fourth one from the right, third one from the left, and then um, Stolpe is the only sort of East German of major stature in Brandenburg, you know, uh, who. Uh, made it into the first generation of minister presidents uh, for the eastern states. Now, in terms of economy, the promise of flourishing landscapes was a think uh, you know an honest self-deception by Helmut Kohl. He expected a repeat of the 1948 economic miracle and was rather disappointed that it did not happen. Why did it not happen? Uh, there are a whole bunch of reasons why this hasn't quite worked. One of them has to do with East German pressures, because the East Germans wanted their, um, what I once at the border in crossing called play money, uh, for which I was then <laughs> strip searched and locked for three quarters of an hour <laughs> in a cubicle. Uh, you know, they wanted their money uh, exchanged one to one for West German currency. Uh, and what happened is about 1 to 1.5. That is, the lower amounts of money were exchanged 1 to 1, and then some of the savings accounts were exchanged 1 to 2. That's why I have this in between. But the problem is that the productivity in East Germany was only one third of the West. And if you exchange the money 1 to 1 with your salaries and stuff 1 to 1, and the productivity is one third, you're two thirds behind. <laughs> That is, it's great if you want to finally buy Western goods, which is what they did en masse, uh, but it is not so hard if you have industrial structures which should survive. And as a result of it, Eastern industry became quickly uncompetitive. Um, and this was done to stop the population transfer because people you know, had a slogan that said, you know, if the Deutschmark does not come to us, we will go to it, namely to Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, North Rhine-Westphalia, and so on. 
The second reason is um, that wages were raised too quickly, close to the Western level, beyond um, productivity, which was, of course, the result of the trade unions, because they were pressing everybody. They wanted the members you know, of the East German trade union, once that was fused, to stay in the trade union, and you get members to stay by doing something for their salaries, for their wages, right? You know, and so. Uh, the wages came up to about two-thirds uh, within a year and then have gradually come up to somewhere in the mid-80s or low-90s, depending upon uh, what you talk about, although the uh, productivity is still only 0.8, you know, rather than, you know, one-to-one. -one. Um, so that made the Eastern products too expensive as well. And then, of course, there was the huge problem of privatization because if you have publicly owned um, you know, businesses, uh, industrial companies, land, farms, and so on, everything, forests and stuff, you know, manor houses, castles, <laughs> and whatever, you name it, they had it. Uh, then what do you do with it, you know? And in some other East European places, and that was one of the ideas early, they handed out certificates, you know, sort of stock certificates that everybody could own a little bit of something. But this, of course, was not terribly attractive to Western investors, <laughs> you know, because you then have to collect these certificates, you know, from individuals. And so the trusteeship privatization model is a different one in which a kind of a non-government, sort of semi-private, semi-government body sells off uh, the assets of East Germany with the assumption initially that there would be, uh, you know, half a trillion uh, Deutschmark profit, because the East Germans were pretty good at propagandizing themselves, and they claimed to be the 10th biggest industrial power in the world. Now, for 17 million people, that's a you know, fair-sized frog, <laughs> you know, that is one that's croaking very loudly, you know, uh, and is quite disproportionate to what's really behind it. You know. So uh, actually, it turned out to be you know, a huge uh, deficit maker, uh, you know, because uh, you know, once people found out the terrible shape in which many of these factories were in, you know, nobody wanted to buy them. And then there was political pressure that somebody should go and buy them anyway because you couldn't just sort of, you know, tear down all the industrial structures in the East. You had to have something left for people to do uh, and so on. Uh, but it is a neoliberal uh, version of it because the assumption was everything had to be privatized and it was done within four years, which is breathtaking. If you compare it to Poland and some other places where it's, they were still selling things off, you know, I was just looking at, uh, at Nova Huta uh, this morning. It took until 2000, January 2005 until Mittal bought, you know, that's 15 years, you know, later on. And that is the point that I'm making here about a long-range structural policy. The question is whether or not it wouldn't have been more intelligent to schlep a few uh, of these companies through uh, until they were once again sort of semi-competitive and then try to privatize them. But the you know shock therapy assumption is you do it quickly, it hurts a lot, but then it's over and you can start anew. So this is a debate among economists. And uh, since those are the theologians of the modern world, I do not want to get really involved in it. You know. Now, the fourth thing in, in this was also the collapse of the East European and East German domestic market, because once currencies became convertible again, they could buy uh, anywhere. And it turns out that Asia was cheaper than you know, the GDR. And why would you want to buy a Trabi if you could buy a Hyundai you know, from uh, Korea you know, or a Toyota from Japan? and stuff. And so, you know, this didn't really work. And then they refused to buy their own products because they were, of course, not advertised nearly as well. You know, if you have, you know, I love this, you know, if you went, you had only one kind of toilet paper in East Germany, and it was gray and abrasive, okay? I mean, it was really good for you, okay? Whereas you go into a Western, <laughs> You know, store you know in West Berlin, and you have 50 kinds of toilet paper. <laughs> and uh, you know, okay, I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, you can please yourself any way you want. You know, with that, 
you know, but to me that is sort of a classic kind of a comparison between a state socialist economy and a Western economy. And so, you know, I can understand, you know, that, you know, they were buying, you know, Western toilet paper rather than continuing their own. But the result was, of course, if you were in a factory making that stuff, nobody wanted to buy it afterwards. And then, too, you had uh, problems, okay? Now, structurally speaking, of course, it was a double transition or a triple transition, but economically speaking, double, from plan to market and from protection to global competition. And that's, I think, what did the East European economies in, uh, in general, uh, relatively quickly. Because nobody knew how to do that, how to privatize, and then if you can overnight make your currencies convertible and have world market competition, then it's extremely difficult to survive on your own. Um, and that, of course, leads to mass unemployment, and this is a demonstration, you know, here, and eventually also to fragmented redevelopment. That is my uh, version of it. It doesn't stay only at collapse, but it has some areas which really go down the tubes completely and some other areas that start flourishing. Uh, this, you know, is a kind of... Uh, Propaganda, Aufschwung Ost, wir packen an. You know, this is the early phase of Western products, you know, in a shop window. And if you un remember the sort of dusty kind of, uh, you know, unloved, you know, shop windows of the East, and then you had something that actually had interesting looking stuff in it, all of which you could buy if you had money, then of course the difference is enormous. And consumption is one of the things that drove this. Now, the result of the conversion is then widespread deindustrialization. The labor force shrank um, from 8.9 to 5.9 million people in two to three years. I mean, that's an enormous loss, you know. Uh, about one-fifth of the workforce was unemployed officially, especially women, older workers, and people who wanted to get jobs at the beginning. And that doesn't even count the people who were parked in Arbeitsbeschaffungsmaßnahmen in the famous ABM uh, were being retrained so that we now have, of course, East German um, waders in Switzerland. Uh, when you go skiing or so, suddenly you have somebody and it doesn't have a Yugoslav accent or whatever, it is an East German, it's a Saxon accent and so on, you know, which is rather surprising because you know, people move out when there are no jobs. And that required then, after all, and it got very expensive for the taxpayers, big Western transfers in the German Unity Fund and various other instruments because there is a 7.5% surcharge on the income tax. Now, think how that would play in the House, <laughs> okay, for the sake of national unification. And, you know, various other welfare systems, of course, had their contributions go up, too, because if you have, you know, health insurance, you know, and the East Germans never paid a penny into that, you know, and suddenly they're all, you know, people, you know, who have to have their medical expenses reimbursed by this health insurance and so on, then it gets rather expensive. The problem, in my mind, is that too much money was put into maintaining the social safety net instead of funding new investments. The social safety net funding keeps social strife down, and I'm all for the fact that uh, East German omas, uh, elderly retired women, should have more money than Western omas because the East German ones worked many more years you know, than the Western ones and stuff, but you have to sort of think, you know, also not just about the present, but also about the future. The investments were all supposed to come from private industry and so on, and not all of them came from there. Um, that means that there are only limited growth areas in East Germany right now. Uh, there was a promising start of the catch-up process from about 93, 92, 93, after the first sort of you know, boom, you know, they fall into a hole and, you know, half of the industry goes away and then they started catching up until the later 90s and then we got what is known as the savings and loan crisis, right? Uh, in a big uh, friendly country, you know, that had then effects also, you know, on the German economy and then you have uh, the IT bubble and so on, okay? Yes, I know there's a euro crisis and I will put ashes on my head, you know, in a moment, you know. 
Okay. So what you then get is a discrepancy between the improvement in individual living standards uh, and regional economic uh, stagnation, because the living standards is also done by transfer payments. Uh, but the stagnation, of course, has to do with the erosion of the industrial uh, cores and the fact that a lot of the East German industry is an extended workbench, as one says in German, uh, of the West, where they're just making things that are designed and corporately headquartered you know, in the West. And these are some of the unemployment figures. Uh, the upper curve is, of course, the East German curve. The lowest curve is the West German curve, and the one curve in the middle or, you know, is the one that is the amalgamated un unemployment rate. And this is a you know, famous uh, potash works, Kali, uh, in Bischof Rode, you know, which was occupied for a while by the workers themselves, but, of course, if you have a business that is being shut down, then occupying the business and striking doesn't really help you <laughs> because you have no leverage because it's going down uh, anyway. And this is just a picture um, which was one of the ironies of unification that after about 10 or 15 years, a lot of the East German infrastructure was better than the Western infrastructure because it had all been built new, whereas the Western people had gotten told, you just hang on for another five or 10 years, we'll get back to you as soon as we fix the East. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, so, you know, some of the nicest Autobahnen are now in East Germany. Um, okay. Now, third point, social adjustment. Um, there were also, of course, considerable difficulties in coping with the new situation among the people, um, because before the wall, you know, Germans always said oud and odd over how similar they were still, because they were really not close enough to get together to find out how different they had become. And when the wall is gone, the fact that, you know, they all, you know, uh, you know, went and watched soccer games and drank beer or, you know, had coffee and cake on Sunday afternoon, you know, wasn't really decisive anymore, but the different social systems, you know, had really moved them uh, considerably apart. The basic thing is the transition from collectivism to individualism. If you've been brought up, you know, if you sat on a little party uh, as a two-year-old together with 10 other, you know, little kids and stuff, you know, rather than being brought up just, you know, in a single parent family, you know, you have imprinted in you a kind of horizon that is collectivist rather than individualist. You know, and you think as a member of a group and not how to get ahead as an individual. And various strategies, you know, in a party dictatorship like vitamin B, which is the German version for networking, for knowing somebody who can do you a favor and stuff. You know, they were no longer quite as relevant, and you had to learn new things like filling out questionnaires, tax forms, you know, life insurance policies, and whatever. And you had various kinds of Western folks, you know, knocking on your door, you know, selling you something and making you sign on the line, and suddenly you had an encyclopedia coming that you never wanted, and <laughs> whatever, you know. Moreover, the social hierarchies were turned topsy turvy because members of the ruling party, the you know, People's Army or the Secret Service, no longer had any advantages. As a matter of fact, you had to hide it. Whereas if you had gone to church, if you were one of the you know, less than 10% of the population that were still Christian and stuff, or if you had been a dissident or whatever, that now got you a job and so on, okay? Women were hit especially hard by the transition because uh, the GDR had an extensive network of social services for women like childcare, abortion rights, uh, homework day, and whatever, and factories had social services attached to them, okay? So the nursery, you know, was a factory run one, or the theater group was a factory theater group, okay? You know, and women, of course, had control of the soft part of these factories, okay? And when the factories tried to survive, first thing they ditched was the soft part because, you know, whether you had a good play didn't really make any difference, but whether your product could still be sold on the rope market, that's how you got to survive. So, you know, this is not a plot, but this is a response to a structural situation, okay?
Uh, one of the key issues were abortion rights because the East Germans had a female support policy but also a more liberal ruling because um, the Christian Democrats were not in government there and so they could not, the Catholic Church, it was very small and could therefore not determine whether abortions were legal or not legal and the sort of crazy West German compromise where they're illegal but not persecuted <laughs> and de facto <laughs> you know, exist, you know, is something that you only need West Germany for, you know. There are idiocies in democracy as well as we know. Uh, many institutions of the GDR collapsed and too few were replaced. The Academy of Sciences went down the tubes and it was cut up into various kinds of pieces that went to the Max Planck, to Helmholtz or the Leibniz Gemeinschaft, including the Research Institute on Contemporary History, which I chaired. Um, and there were many dismissals because the East German science apparatus was bloated. You had, they just didn't work as hard, many of them, and so on. Houses of culture were closed, youth clubs were closed, uh, trade union vacation homes were closed. You could still go through East Germany to a lake and you see these little abandoned cottages behind some fences with holes in them and stuff, you know, all over. And only some of them were replaced by commercial offerings because why would you want to go to Mecklenburg if you could go to Italy? You know, um, I mean, okay, uh, many reasons why you should go to Mecklenburg because you don't have to drive that far, and besides, you, you know, you don't have to fry, you know, quite as much either. You know, together with ten thousand other people at Rimini on the beach, uh, or whatever. But you know, it takes another twenty, thirty years before people learn that they should go back to Mecklenburg. You know, they have to have been to Italy first, and then they can stay. Uh, sports clubs were privatized and commercialized. You know, no longer were there factory teams. No longer was there Stasi support. And the organized doping was also privatized. And uh, <laughs> they actually it went to China, you know. Five years later, if you look at the track and swimming, you know, figures and so on, the Chinese suddenly started coming on in world competition. I hope I'm not offending anybody, but... Uh, you know, some of this is actually provable. Um, and, um, you know, traditional sports clubs were refounded, but there was problem with sponsorship. You know, you had to have money, and therefore there is no East German club uh, in the Federal Soccer League in Germany. Uh, in the second league, there's always a couple of them that are sort of barely hanging on. Um, the generational impact was unequal. The retirees were actually well off because they got West German pensions. Uh, the 55 to 65 generation, or 50 to 65 generation, was hardest hit because they were kicked out of their jobs by and large. The middle cohort of the 35s to 50-year-olds had transition problems, mostly made it. And the young ones, the 16, 17, 18-year-olds and so on, they suddenly had the whole world open to them. They had new fellowships, they could go to Western universities, they could show up in the United States and so on. They could make new careers. So uh, not just gender, but generation is uh, very crucial in the post-communist transition. Um, now, um, in spite of some disparities, I see a process of rapprochement. Uh, okay, East Germany still has more poor people, but there is an improvement in life expectancy, which I think has grown by 10 years since unification. So, I mean, if that's a basic biological indicator of how well people are off and so on, then something positive must have happened. You know, it's just that there is a lot of sort of grousing about uh, unification still out there. Okay, and one of the few heritages of the GDR is the traffic signal. The Ampelmännchen, you know, I mean, they were considered to be cute and therefore they were permitted to survive. But other legacies, of course, are what to do with the Secret Service stuff, uh, which, you know, has, of course, a, they being Germans have an enormous record, you know, of documentation. The Foreign Service, excuse me, the foreign espionage people managed to destroy their files except for the Rosenholz, uh, you know, Datei. Uh, and we can get into the Stasi issue, I think, uh, in the discussion. Let me just go over it, I have, since I have two more points that I want to briefly touch upon. Um, cultural conflicts, a mixture of joy over being free and nostalgic feelings about the loss of security. Writers, actors, and rock musicians were relieved about the end of censorship, the freedom of travel, 
and the chance to experiment with new styles, but at the same time, they lost their privileges and protection of state-supported culture, uh, their salaries. And they had to be you know, at the mercy of the market. They suddenly had to do something that people actually liked. Uh, instead of you know some cultural functionary you know permitted, East East German intellectuals also felt offended by having their status decline since they were no longer needed as stand-ins for public space. If you have a free public with media of a different plural you know uh, orientations and stuff, you don't have to write a novel you know anymore in order to sort of subtly suggest that yes. You know, not everything is really going quite as well in the GDR as it should. And everybody then buys the book and says, yeah, you know, have you read? You know, this was known as Bukvar. This was stuff for which you had to bend down because you got it under the table, you know, in East Germany. Uh, and so on, once you can start, you know, buying it regularly on the rack and so on, it just somehow loses a little bit of its appeal. Uh, and then there was a literary quarrel about Christa Wolf, uh, you know, um, some of the intellectuals found a new role as interpreter of the GDR and spokesman for Eastern problems, which is one of the reasons why the sort of complaints among the East are out there in the public uh, very strongly. Um, but one of the difficulties is the renaming of streets. You know, Clement Gottwald Allee suddenly became the Berliner Allee again. And you can do German history by street signs. You know, if it was the Kaiser Wilhelm Allee to begin with, and then the Friedrich Ebert Allee, <laughs> at some point Berliner Allee, then it was probably the Schlageter Allee, or the, you know, or the Hermann Göring Straße. <laughs> You know, then it had a communist name and stuff. But you know, but this is all about identity and home because you live on a street. And how would you like it if people came along and suddenly made your street sign, you know, something else again? Even if you connected nothing, you know, with the content of it. And of course, if you went hiking, and that's why I love this slide. You know, after you know the fall of the wall, then you suddenly would come to areas in which there were streets that weren't on the map or in which streets on the map didn't exist in reality because you know, these were maps produced uh, if the class and find, if the class enemy invaded the GDR, that they would get lost. <laughs> You know, and so you did in hiking, and this was not so totally harmless because, of course, there was lots of ammunitions in various kinds of uh, you know military training grounds, uh, so that you there were big signs you know uh, you know along the the path you know do not you know <laughs> go and freelance to the side and so on. Okay. Um, there was a rigorous debunking of the SED dictatorship because it hadn't worked well enough with the Nazis. German intellectuals said, this time around, we're going to get it really right. You know, and they went after the SED. Uh, through media revelations, there was a parliamentary commission of inquiry twice. And there's a federal you know, bureaucracy for the Stasi records in which you can also apply and have them check whether or not somebody spied on you when you were there. Uh, and the totalitarianism paradigm, which had been um, sort of left behind, suddenly made you know a great recovery, because it was uh, simple. Because if red equals brown, that is, the red dictatorship is the same as the brown dictatorship. Never mind the Second World War and the 27 million dead Russians and stuff. It must have been a minor misunderstanding between the two, right? Uh, you know, then you know it's clear. You know, the West is the good guys, and the East is the bad guys, and the East is totalitarian, and the West is democratic. Everything is settled, right? You know, and that led to accusations that the East was an Unrechtsstaat, an illegitimate state, or a state that did not have the rule of law. You know, and the problem was, of course, that a lot of the East German population felt this as disparagement of their own life story which triggered a form of nostalgia, which in German is known as N hyphen nostalgie, because it's a play on the word of nostalgia, OK? That was quickly commercially exploited. Uh, and this is one of the success stories. The East German Champagne Company actually bought one of the leading West German ones, OK? The revenge of the small. And you know there were rock bands that suddenly reappeared. and. Uh, East shops that were created, and of course the taking down of monuments was also something that was highly controversial. This is uh, Lenin's head that is being moved here, in case you are wondering. <laughs>
Now, nostalgia was an answer to the problems of transition. You know, the East suddenly appeared much nicer than it had ever been in the past, uh, according to the argument that not everything that was in the GDR was really bad. Uh, another argument was, you Westerners are just, you know, riding your high horse. We already have the global transformation behind us, and we are ahead of you. This is a sort of, you know, East German intellectual, you know, that always has to be in the forefront of the next kind of big structural development in the world. And on the Western side, there was much misunderstanding, ignorant arrogance. There was a lovely book by a doctor's wife who bitched about being in Brandenburg because she could not have Gucci and uh, you know, Dior and whatever, you know, in the sort of little East German country town to buy because her life suddenly had no purpose anymore. Uh, and of course, a little bit more serious were, is the resentment about the financial sacrifices that accuses the Easterners of ingratitude. And so we have two new concepts, a besser Vesi, that's a Westerner who knows, knows it better. And besser, better is the same word. And the Yama Ossi, that's an Easterner who is always complaining and whining and so on, okay? And so you can have nice sort of, you know, controversies in the train, you know, and accuse people of being whatever, you know. But of course, some of the cultural production is also fun. Goodbye Lenin is, uh, is, is fun, and uh, there are, you know, uh, lives of others and stuff, you know. Okay, and this is a nostalgia shop now. Ihr Ostladen, in case you want pickles from the Spreewald, you know, this is where you need to go. Now, last point is foreign policy discontinuities. That's actually where li the least changed. Uh, the old Federal Republic dominates foreign policy. The initial fears of the neighbors, the Danes, the Dutch, or the Israelis, that the Fourth Reich was right around the corner were vastly exaggerated uh, since the Germans were in practice reluctant to play an open leadership role in Europe, and many of them still are. For the first time in German history, they had a constitution that was recognized by everybody. The borders were stable. The Germans were internationally embedded and surrounded by friends, as they say. It's just, this is a play on encirclement in the Kaiser, okay, from 100 years earlier. Encirclement meant that everybody's out to get you, okay? You know, whereas now you have friendly states around. Therefore, the habit of being a civilian power has continued. Multilateralism in the European Union and NATO has continued, and checkbook diplomacy has largely been maintained. In the first Iraq war, that came a little bit too early. Uh, after unification, they didn't even have a united military yet at that point, and therefore they didn't want to uh, intervene. And uh, there has been a continuation officially of German-American friendship. I have here uh, Schroeder and Clinton instead of Merkel and, uh, and Bush. Uh, with Obama, the relationship is a little bit tougher, I think. Uh, there is less sort of uh, emotion behind it. The real issue in foreign policy is uh, foreign troop deployment. The German military has actually shrunk enormously. If you count, the West German had almost 500,000, I think, at one point, plus East German had about 250,000. You're down to less than 200,000. The Germans, uh, you know, have changed their doctrine from tanks against the Russians to flexibility for international missions. Easterners are still skeptical of NATO as a result of decades of propaganda. They don't like military deployment. Um, though a considerable part of the troops and many officers come from East Germany, which is a little bit sort of the German regionalism like the South and the United States. Um, there's been a gradual constitutional acceptance of peace missions since the Constitutional Court in October 94 approved multilateral missions as long as the Bundestag voted for them. Um, so there are now Germans fighting in Yugoslavia, not fighting but you know, on the ground in Kosovo in Afghanistan, but not in Iraq, because um, the second Iraq war was considered by the Germans a preventive war. And some of us who are historians and think about the arguments about World War I and then say, if World War I was the German er preventative war, then what the hell was the second Iraq war? Uh, I would like to know. And in Libya, they chickened out. <laughs> 
Uh, it's an open question, the issue of European leadership. We can get to that in a moment. My sense is damned if you do and damned if you don't, because if they do, then Merkel is pictured with a mustache and a divided haircut and so on. You know, Merkel as Hitler or Merkel in SS boots and so on. And we once saw at the opera in West Berlin, uh, and if anything, Merkel is deeply civilian. I think, you know, uh, military is the last thing I would associate uh, with her and so on. Uh, and, you know, the transatlantic view is they should do more, but the European view is, you know, if you ask a Greek about German leadership, you know, we had Venizelos here a few days ago, then they will tell you uh, that the Germans are leading too much and in the wrong direction. Uh, this is what Bundeswehr looks like when it is uh, deployed abroad. Uh, K4. In my sense, also, it has to do with excessive expectations, hope, and fear. Uh, <laughs> the Germans have the strongest economy in Europe. They are playing a leading role in the Euro crisis. Personally, I think that the mix of austerity, restructuring, and aid is the right one. You have to do all three things at the same time. Just shoveling money at them like Krugman would like to is, I think, the wrong thing. Any of you who have had teenagers and know what they are like, what happens when you give them more money <laughs> and, uh, without <laughs> asking anything from them, you know, know that this isn't going to work. And austerity alone does, of course, not work in the long run either. You know, If people live above their mean, means, they have to come down to the level of what is sustainable, and then you, know, you have to help them move forward. I think there is a careful approach towards military interventions. Uh, there are slowly more signs of independent policy. Uh, Merkel is somewhere between Cameron uh, and Hollande, uh, you know, ideologically, geographically, you know, uh, whatever, you know. The concept is a central power defending the European model of the social market economy. That is, I think, where they are uh, right now, and I think probably where they ought to continue to stay. Uh, I just had to do this because there are, of course, in the south of this euro, various pieces that are crumbling and that are moving out and away. We, of course, all hope that the glue will be strong enough that this will not happen. Unification, therefore, in my mind, needs to be understood as a process. After four decades of division, it needs an equal length of time in order to come back together again. In comparison, and there is a typo, with other East European countries, the German unification transition is both privileged and problematic. The advantage is because you enter in a functioning order, a proven democracy. The disadvantage is you have little chance to determine yourself, reinvent yourself, and maintain Eastern traditions. Um, the inequality of the starting conditions is still having an effect. The GDR dissolved itself and joined the Federal Republic. Therefore, it is not a merger of equals, which made the acceptance of Western patterns inevitable. The results, therefore, a quarter of a century later, are still mixed. Much was achieved in terms of repairing infrastructure and improving life chances, but there are still considerable challenges due to outmigration, and much of it depends upon what the economy will do. Patience is therefore necessary. The disparities are already smaller than between the richest county in the United States and the poorest county in the United States. Chances are there. They only need to be seized. And this is the last slide. I just wanted to show you what Leipzig looked like in the mid-1990s, in case any of you have been there recently. Um, you know a massive redevelopment uh, of those places in East Germany that are economically uh, vibrant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad, for this uh, brilliant reassessment, uh, Germanifications 25 years later. The center hosts uh, on a regular basis a number of uh, Korean scholars and, and policymakers. And we just had the Korean president, the new Korean president in town. If, um, if Korea, a unification of the Korean peninsula was at hand, what would be your key advice to um, the Korean president? Or let me put it this way, what was perhaps the biggest mistake um, 
uh, Germany made in its process? Well, we've actually had at my former institute uh, Korean delegations asking the same question. Uh, and uh, we try to sort of say it may be difficult, but it's worth it. You know, do it. You know, and uh, there is no blueprint. You can't, uh, you know, you can't transfer that. I think it needs to be prepared would be the first part. You know, if you have a gradual rapprochement and a growing back together by softening the borderline and so on, then you have much better chances than if you have some kind of high-level international agreement and it comes overnight and for decades you haven't had any real contacts with each other. So I think prior sort of preparation is crucial. Secondly, you know, if there is aid, there has to be aid, and aid will, it co it will cost a lot. Go into it knowing that it's going to cost, okay? And say to the population, it's going to cost. Maybe you can buy your second or third car, you know, five years later, you know. But, you know, some things in life are worth it, you know. And if you have responsibility, if you think of yourself as a community that, you know, encompasses also the eastern part or the northern part of Korea, you know, then, you know, you have to be ready to make that sacrifice. Thirdly, do treat your partners as equals as much as possible. Even if they will end up having to take over perhaps 90% of your system, uh, you know, give them the 10% or 15 or 20% of their system if this makes f them feel better because they're going to bitch a whole lot less <laughs> if you do that. If they have the feeling that you sort of acknowledge their different life trajectories uh, and take them seriously as individual people and as collective, um, unification will be much easier. Those would be my top three. Okay, very good. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions. I'm sure there are a good number here given the number of experts in the room. Okay, we'll start. Why don't we work ourselves around the, the table? So we'll start with Don and then move on. If you could please wait for the microphone and identify yourself, please, so that Conrad knows who we're speaking to. Hi, I'm Don Wolfensberger, senior scholar here at the Wilson Center. I'm wondering whether there's any kind of a hangover from the Stasi era in the East in terms of political engagement, involvement, uh, and so on. For instance, how does voter turnout in the East and West compare? How does uh, engagement in political debate and so on compare? Is that pretty much generational and disappearing? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. I mean, you know, because one of the responses under communism was private uh, withdrawal into private niches. You know, and it's you know one of the sort of classic characterizations of East Germany is niche society. Uh, I think on the formal political um, part, the differences are relatively limited. But what I think is uh, the real difference is in civil society. You know that East Germany had, uh, you know, through um, government, Gleichschaltung, coordination. Um, you know, not much of a civil society left except for the Protestant church because all the associational life was state controlled and politicized and so on. And, you know, and already bef in the 80s, the civil society begins to reemerge gradually, but it is much weaker uh, than in the West. And so I think it is that kind of public engagement that considers, uh, continu continues to be much, much more problematic in the East than uh, going and voting uh, for political parties. Uh, you meant two brief questions. You mentioned you Stephen yourself? Shore. Uh, you mentioned about the disappearance of a state. Wasn't the disappearance of Prussia a signal event in the formation of the Bundesrepublik? And as far as um, a, 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 should Korean unification occur, would supersize statues of whoever is president of South Korea in, uh, in the North um, calm down the, the public mood there? Yes, uh, 1947 and the disappearance of Prussia is a gift of the Allies, you know. And uh, in some ways, I, you know, I, the historians, of course, are arguing about, you know, whether the cliché, 
of the monocled Junkers, which the British love dearly. Uh, it's really more British hang-up than an American hang-up, you know. Uh, whether that, you know, how much of a difference it it made, I, you know, it given World War One and given the role of the officer corps until the July 20th, 1944 conspiracy, it is very understandable that there was a great deal of. Uh, Hatred of Prussia, and that Prussia was also an inter uh, that hatred was also internal in the GDR, uh, and has led to a couple of big building projects because the Stadtschloss in Potsdam, uh, which had as a ruin survived the Second World War, and the one in Berlin, you know, the Potsdam one is almost finished. <laughs> they are still building as we speak. The Berlin one is going to be rebuilt in some kind of way. So Prussia is a kind of symbolic, uh, you know, referent is what I'm trying to say, you know, with that part of it, uh, and it is was liberating because Prussia, and that's of course the problem with Prussia. Prussia was social democratic in the Weimar Republic. It was a stronghold of democracy rather than a stronghold of reaction and so on. But never mind. It is the older Prussia that they were responding to and that they wanted to get rid of. Uh, and um, that's also why they uh, divided, uh, you know, the GDR into into administrative districts afterwards in order to obliterate any kind of uh, uh, German territorial um, emotion. Uh, you know, the Saxons could no longer be Saxons and whatever, the Brandenburgers, you know. And that is one of the reasons why in the redemocratization these federal uh, units were restored in spite of the fact that some of them are small in population, just a couple million people or whatever, and are not really economically viable, but they are psychologically viable. Over here to Hope Harrison. It's coming behind you, Hope. Thank you, Hope Harrison, George Washington University. Thank you so much, Conrad, for um, all these thoughts on the process. Um, I agree it's a process. And I have a question to you about the thing that fascinates me the most about it is something you mentioned about how unique this case is, of course, because East Germany disappeared and they made that decision um, to be absorbed into West Germany. And so the process of sort of perpetrators and victims from the East um, hasn't really been able to play out, or definitely hasn't been able to play out on its own the way it could in any other country, a uh, former communist country that, you know, got rid of the communist regime, but they didn't get taken over by someone else. And so sort of dealing with that past and, um, the perpetrators, whether they were in the Stasi or um, Berlin Wall border guards, you know, has taken place um, even though the process was instigated by East Germans themselves. The fact that West Germans dominated all the senior positions in United Germany meant that it turned somehow weirdly into sort of an East West issue, even though it's, you know, it wasn't. And so I'd just like to hear your observations on that East-East process between perpetrators and victims. And you mentioned pensions and that um, people who had been um, sort of older when Germany United did really well, they got great pensions. Well, those were, of course, the people that were in some of those perpetrator-type uh, positions. It sure wasn't the case for the victims um, and, of course, Finally, I'd love to hear what you think about um, pressure to build a monument to victims of the communist regime in Germany. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a very, as you well know, a muddled and complex kind of an issue. Um, things came together uh, here. Um, in some ways, the preservation of the Stasi records is one of the f one of the few victories of the East German opposition for United Germany uh, and uh, it's and there you know it it the West the government Kohl, Schäuble and so on wanted to have them either destroyed or sealed put away and so on they didn't want them out in part also of course because they contained material about them 
you know, I mean, it wasn't entirely disinterested and so on. Um, and of course, in the background was the feeling of intellectuals that the denazification had not gone the way in which it should have gone uh, after the Second World War, and that there were a lot of things swept under the rug, and a lot of former Nazi party members then ended up in various kinds of high positions, you know, in the Foreign Service, you know, especially in, uh, you know, in, in the Ministry of Interior, and we get all sorts of studies these days, you name the bureaucracy, they're having a commission of inquiry, and historians are writing another book about you know, how many Nazis you know, were in it. So we now know more uh, about it. And that led to a kind of resolution on both sides, on the side of the Western intellectuals and Eastern intellectuals the second time around. They would be more rigorous, and they would do it right. Of course, involved in this also then is an Eastern fight for positions. Uh, and you know, and also partly a Western one, because if you can have a kind of a collective um, sort of response, one of my um, one of my dissertation students has just finished a dissertation on internment camps after World War II, you know, and the policy of automatic arrest, and it is a, like a policy of automatic arrest is a policy of automatic Stasi membership. You know, if that then takes you out of politics and you have somebody with whom you're in competition and all you have to do is prove that this person, you know, worked for the Stasi in some fashion or other, then you are rid of this opponent and this is also very convenient. So, uh, the, you know, there are various problems associated with it. it. You know, the discussion was not really about what a particular individual did, how bad that was, but rather about formal criteria. And since you couldn't always prove that, the proof often had to do with lying about it. That is, everybody had to fill out a questionnaire, like the 101, 31 questions you know, after 1945 in the American zone. And then if you wrote down, you know, left it blank, and then somebody found out you were, that was automatic grounds for dismissal and stuff. So what you have is a kind of process uh, you know, of replacing personnel which is crude and undifferentiated. Uh, and you have a kind of discussion which in the media turned into a kind of red and white discussion because as long as you can make hay an election campaign about people with red socks, you know, that is anybody on the left was called by the CDU or especially by the Bavarian CSU you know, as wearing red socks, and that just meant, you know, it was, you were completely beyond the pale. You know, you couldn't vote, and so on. Then, you know, once again, you know, that leads in the public mind to cliches, you know, and to oversimplifications. <coughs> so it, it is a very difficult process in which, you know, you have East-East fights, you have West-West fights, and you have alliances between, you know, West conservatives and Eastern victims, and you have alliances between Western liberals and Eastern ex-communists and so on, or, you know, people who were sort of socialists of the heart, as George Mossy would have said, and so on. So, you know, all I could do is scratch the surface in order to complicate the thing a little bit to... Uh, because uh, really dealing with it and giving you a definitive answer, uh, you know, uh, maybe you will do that in your new book. Thank you. Piotr? Um, could you wait for the microphone? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Piotr Kosicki, I have a question about um, a couple of countries that didn't actually make it into your list of countries that might have feared a Fourth Reich. And I feel like this is part of the success story if we look at the foreign <laughs> policy dimension, right? Uh, how successful Germany has been in reestablishing systematic and very close economic, cultural, etc. relations with countries like Poland, Czech Republic, et cetera, that, that in 89, 90 would have been, in, at least in part, deeply fearful of reunification. I'm just curious where you see that fitting into the overall picture, and then more specifically, to what extent is the ex issue still an issue? Because this is one of those cross 
cutting issues that always seem to trouble me in terms of the reunification of memory, West German and East German, right? Because we had expellees end up all over the place, and it's it's a national issue, although clearly more of an East German issue on a more immediate level. Thanks. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, I should have talked about it, but since I didn't really talk about the process of unification, that is itself, unification itself, uh, it dropped out. No, I mean, you know, I have um, had a former dissertation student, um, you know, um, who's now teaching at San Diego, um, who did a lovely dissertation uh, on the prehistory uh, of Polish-German uh, reconciliation, um, and uh, Willy Brandt and, you know, these things. Of course, you know, the issue of the eastern borders raised its ugly head again uh, in 1989-90, and uh, the CDU is a party that gets a lot of votes from refugees, uh, and, and therefore Cole was playing to the refugees, and he had to be compelled uh, by uh, Western allies. Uh, in no uncertain terms that, you know, this would not fly. If he wanted reunification, one of the, one of the price, prices was um, a definitive recognition. And he dragged his feet and uh, was not very sort of liberal and democratic about, you know, the process, but eventually, you know, he caved in on it, um, which, you know, I'm very glad to see. Now, the other dimension that is crucial is that in the 1980s, the dissidents in Poland and Czechoslovakia understood that the way to Western Europe physically and politically led through East Germany. Now, this is of enormous importance because until German Ostpolitik, the glue that held the Eastern Bloc together was the fear of Nazi revanchism. You know, and that was, of course, Stalin's trick. If you move, you know, the, whatever they're called in English, uh, yeah, the, the borders, but but it's the, no, yeah, it's the goalpost, you know, I would be in soccer, but it's the Streichhölzer, you know, on the table. The anecdote is about, uh, I'm just lost, I'm, occasionally it happens, a word is gone. You know, anyway, I mean, you know, if you have the Churchill-Stalin agreement and stuff and you move, you know, the borders to the west and so on, then you set up a revanchist situation and you make the, the moved country then forever dependent on your friendship because, you know, the other ones can come and get you and then you have nothing because first he steals your eastern territories and then, you know, the other ones are new and they're only at the sufferance and so on. And, and therefore, you know, no, I mean, that is a result of Ostpolitik and of also undercutting the Iron Curtain through civil society contacts and so on beforehand. And I think in that way, I think in, in psychologically, Poland had almost something like a veto power uh, over the process, you know, although they were not formally in the two plus four negotiations, they were probably the country outside of these negotiations that was closest in touch, you know, with what was going on. Um, the expertise have lost power as a result. In some ways, the project, the highly controversial project uh, of this museum that, you know, I am having difficulties with, you know, uh, uh, is, I mean, that's not the one that Christian and I work on. I'm just <laughs> trying to, you know, make sure that we don't have a misunderstanding, you know, is in some ways a kind of compensatory symbolic move and so on for something that they will never get, you know, which is the, the right to the homeland or whatever. And in the GDR, of course, already in the early 1950s, they were forbidden to organize. They were treated as if they had been totally amalgamated in the, in the population. And that made it, of course, harder for the East Germans in order to deal with uh, the you know, trauma of mass flight and expulsion and so on. Uh, than it would have been if they would have been able to move, meet once a year and sing songs and talk in their dialect to each other, you know, and, uh, you know, drink too much beer and, uh, and make political statements which they shouldn't make, and then they go back and they're integrated in West Germany for all impractical intents and purposes, you know. So, you know, I think, you know, I am encouraged, you know, as a, you know, in my experience as director of this research institute for contemporary history, we were working together with many Polish and Czech colleagues, we had common projects together and so on. And when we had a conference in, in 
in Brandenburg, uh, in, in Potsdam, in, uh, I think it was in 95 and so on, I insisted on two lectures you know, that needed to be given before the conference could start. The conference was supposed to be on refugees in Brandenburg, okay? And I said, we need one lecture on Hitler and ethnic cleansing and Holocaust, and we need a second lecture on the Polish movement westward, because if you don't have that context, then the whole refugee business is absurd. And I have another dissertation student who is now working on, on the construction of a refugee memory. Thank you. Carl, I'd like to push you on something you, you said in response to my earlier question about you know the time a divided country needs to uh, prepare for unification and to create or develop a common identity. And uh, my question is, in part, I mean, you, your talk really emphasized, sometimes a little bit ironically, the differences um, and the difficulties in coming together. Is there is there today an all-German identity um, uh, uh, that that's um, um, more than um, uh, the addition of both parts, the sum of both parts. Um, uh, I'm thinking that maybe some of it sort of come, came out in, you know, during the World Cup a couple of years ago and on other occasions, but is there anything more one can say about this? And then as a sort of subsidiary question to that, what piece of that is, East, is a legacy or what piece of that is an East German contribution, if there is any, to this common um, to this, you know, new German uh, post-unification identity. Um, um, are there certain trends? You may have hinted at that in your, your um, uh, presentation that uh, East German be uh, reinforced in what was already going on in, in West German, or is there more to be said? Um, hopefully it's more than just sort of the... Uh, common appreciation of Germans in East and West and something that lived on in East Germany for a good longer uh, than in West Germany, which is, you know, the famous German FKK culture. But uh, there must be more than that. Well, yeah, I mean, the climate, of course, keeps the FKK culture in hand. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, this is, you know, <coughs> you know going to the beach, you know, swimming without uh, textiles. You know, <laughs> that is letting the sun shine on your whole body and so on. But, uh, you know, if you have a kind of rainy summer, you know, that, that makes it a kind of uh, project uh, of, uh, well, of strained. Okay, um, uh, I think, you know, I still think that for the, okay, well, let me just back up a little bit. The easiest part of the answer would be, the people who were in my seminars in Potsdam. You know, towards the end of my directorship uh, of the institute there, um, I couldn't tell anymore which of the students were West and East, you know, in the seminar. Because at the beginning, it was still fairly clear because the Westerners often didn't know a whole lot, but boy, could they talk. I mean, their mouth flapped, and they had an opinion on anything, and the East Germans would kind of sit there like that, and if you would poke at them, they would have all sorts of information in their head that the Western ones didn't have. But trying to get an opinion out of them was squeezing blood out of a turnip, you know, because that's this collectivism kind of business. They were not used to sort of articulating themselves, and they wanted to know what I thought was right so that they could write it down because then they were sure you know, instead of, you know, developing ideas of their own, which is what I was trying to get them to do, you know, and maybe failed. So I think in some ways it's generational. I think, you know, the, the, the you know, maybe not the 18-year-olds at unification. Those are already socialized in either system, you know. I mean, they find their way together. We have one of them living in our house right now, you know, from from the institute, you know, who is finishing his dissertation in the United States in order to get it done and stuff, you know. He is a kind of an east-west hybrid, which is very interesting. But I think, you know, the next, you know, cohort, he was 18 about when unification happened. Uh, the next cohort, I think the ones, you know, who were born in 1989 and so on, you know, those are the ones that are not hybrids, they're just Germans, you know, because for them that's, 
natural. You know, that's the horizon because that's how it was when they got born. That makes makes all the difference. You know, as the, the 65 year olds or whatever for them, Germany together was also natural. It was the people in between. You know, okay. Now criteria, social solidarity. I think, and equality. You know, is a thing that East Germans will be pushing. I think relationships to Eastern Europe, the sort of recentering of Germany uh, in the middle of Europe instead of being the easternmost uh, outpost of the West. You know, uh, you know the outpost cinema in Berlin. You know, for American GIs and stuff. It, that's that's the name. You know, you're fighting communism. You're the outpost of Western Civ. You know, uh, and um, maybe foreign policy pacifism. You know. Uh, because of this suspicion, which I think is is propaganda product, is irrational and stuff, you know, of, of Western alliance things, and I think you know a somewhat broader, um, a somewhat broader appreciation of German culture. I mean, it makes a difference if you can go to um, Eisleben and Eisenach, and various places, Wittenberg, where Luther actually preached. You know when that isn't just something that comes up in a textbook very quickly and then you go to Florence for your vacation and stuff or the French Riviera, you know, but, you know, it's, you know, Goethe and Schiller are in Weimar, you know, they're physically located there and if you go to the, the Thuringer Wald or whatever, you know, you can look down, you know, on the Ilmenau from a place, you know, in which one of the poems, you know, was created and so on, okay? And you know, okay, there is lots of German culture that has to do with, with with Königsberg and you know with Breslau, and so on. Those parts are gone, but the other parts are still reappropriatable. You know. So I think, you know, I mean, I'm looking for a kind of uh, incremental seepage, <laughs> you know, as a kind of process. You know, that will that will take a whole while, you know. Uh, and you know, and there have been you know, I mean, some things like you know, uh, whole you know, all-day schools and uh, you know, childcare and walk-in clinics and whatever. I mean, there have been some East German things that have sort of gradually made their way uh, through uh, through Brussels, back into you know, into an all-German kind of thing. Do so you wonder if the East Germans are more sympathetic of uh, Greeks and Italians and Portuguese? These days, yeah, but, uh, I'm not sure because <laughs> their money, you know, they have less of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't. Well, here's the microphone. Um, I just a couple of questions. My name is Mindy Reiser. I had the opportunity to work in the former Soviet Union, particularly Central Asia and the Caucasus. So some of these issues are, are resonant. But a couple of questions in terms of people from the West deciding to move to the former East. Are there people who see this as kind of a, a brave new world or a place for creativity and innovation? And I'm also curious about how the Eastern folks, such as still remain, uh, view the Jewish community that's grown up in Germany, uh, if they have any views on that, and certainly the Holocaust celebrations or commemorations and memorials. Uh, what does the press in that sector write, and how are these changes f perceived? Okay. Um, you know, it, and on the economic level, it was for a while the Wild East, you know, like the Wild West, you know, of American frontier society and so on, because anything went for the first two or three years, because uh, obviously the rules and regulations hadn't been internalized yet. The local bureaucracies often didn't know what the hell they were doing, you know. So that you know, if you did things that were nasty, you know, people couldn't complain because they didn't know that they should complain, you know, and whatever and so on. But that settled down. I mean, you know, relatively quickly. You know, once privatization had taken place, there are places. Uh, where there is Eastern creativity, Leipzig is one of the. That's one of the reasons why I have this up here. You know, there is actually a school of painting and so on that has to do. That started with Matoyer and various people in the GDR, and they now have, you know, various kinds of neorealist artists, you know, and other folks there. So you know, there, you know, there, and you know, and in Berlin, of course, you know, Prenzlauer Berg, you know, is the in Shishi area. <laughs> You know these days of the of the yuppies of the young professionals and so on. 
you know, anybody who wants to be anybody. Um, so, um, you know, the problem is, of course, Hoyos Verda and various former industrial towns and so on where people leave and where especially young women uh, don't seem to see a future for themselves anymore. So, you know, there is still depopulation, but, uh, you know, Potsdam is doing tremendously well, you know, it's, uh, you know, lots of the old uh, turn of the century villas have been redone and there happen to be enough lakes around in between to make this, you know, very nice residential kind of area. Um, so, um, you know, it's uh, still a little bit early. I mean, you know, what I was trying to talk about for a second about the liter literary and the media sort of uh, dealing with it. I mean, there have been a whole generation of novels um, and short stories that have come out, many of them autobiographical, about sort of the last years of the GDR and then the, the rupture, the process of moving over. And a couple of them, you know, are literarily fairly decent. I mean, one of them is called Der Turm, and the other one is in Zeiten des Abnehmenden Lichts. You know, those are the two most uh, famous ones, but, you know, it's it is a subject which is, I think, now become, has become amenable, I think, to treatment, you know. I think at the beginning, the shock was just so enormous, and the worst thing that Günter Grass has ever written, you know, is his attempted novel on German unification, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, these would be just some fragments of an answer, you know. It's on the Jewish you know, question? Ah, oh, the Jewish question, yeah, that's that's very good, that's very interesting and so on, because of course it's a legacy of the GDR. I mean, because the Jewish movement started to East Berlin, you know, and Kaminer, who is one of the, the leading uh, sort of short story writers, radio announcers and so on of the Jewish community in Berlin came already before the war came down to East Berlin, you know, from the Soviet Union. And there is a little bit of a prehistory because finally, and you know, I was co-chairing a commission in the United States, GDR Commission on Contemporary History. And we then, you know, in the last two or three years before the war fell, and there we, you know, had contacts with Kurt Petzold and Irene Runge. And there was a little revival in 1988 already on the East German side where they're beginning, the state was beginning, the party was beginning to allow them to sort of think about Jewish heritage in East Germany, okay? And, it, and there was an American rabbi that went over to East Berlin and the rebuilding of the big synagogue in the Oranienburger Straße already started, you know, uh, during the East German period. So there is a little bit of preparation in that and that which, you know, the, the point of that is that in, in, in intellectuals like Christa Wolf and so on in, and, and, and Heim and, you know, whatever, you know, they were, of course, very much on top of this and were very much in favor of it. The problem comes with the fact that the East Germans were locked up so long, and in many ways, they were more German than the West Germans when unification happened, you know, because they hadn't become as cosmopolitan. They hadn't had the, the freedom of travel, and they hadn't had an engagement. Their idea of fascism was a kind of social structural definition rather than a racist you know, rather than an anti-Semitic definition. So there is a lot of catch up to do, you know, uh, and uh, some of the East German cities, Leipzig, you know, the Simon uh, Dubno Institute, you know, tries it, and Dresden is a new uh, synagogue that one of my former colleagues in Chapel Hill, Henry Landsberger was, re and was involved in helping to get going again. But when you get into the skinhead subculture in these dead industrial towns and stuff like this, you have, there you still have, um, you know, traditional anti-Semitism surviving. Now the difference is that it doesn't really come out because it's white on white racism, and the racism that comes out is white on black in these places. You know, and you know, if I were dark-skinned, I would not go to some of these towns at some hours of the night. And there are some parts of East Berlin that I would not go to either, you know. So the issue <coughs> there is in, in the cosmopolitanism, in the liberalization of civil society and so on, there is still lots of catching up to do on the Eastern side. Thank you. Mel, final question? Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Mel Effler from the University of Virginia. I really enjoyed your, your talk, Conrad. I was wondering if you just take a couple of minutes to talk with a little bit more specificity about um, popular attitudes in East Germany in 1989 and 1990 that uh, facilitated the volunta voluntary incorporation into the West. And so there are three sub-issues here. Um, popular, popular thinking in East Germany about West German political and economic institutions, popular thinking about their own institutions, and popular thinking with regard to the Soviet Union. Um, what, what, what do we now know about those popular grassroots attitudes that led to that voluntary incorporation? I think there is a considerable amount of, of survey material out there because people, sociologists, Western sociologists, started um, tracking that already during the demonstrations, asking people about it. Before that, you really have not much survey research in East Germany. They had a couple of institutes. One was a youth uh, research institute, and another one was a, I mean, a demoscopic institute, and they sh shut the, the, sociologist, uh, the sociology one down. Uh, and the youth one uh, was feeding uh, uh, critical material to Krenz, uh, Honecker's successor, <laughs> you know, uh, but Krenz didn't use it quickly enough, enough of it and so on. So, you know, I mean, they were, and the, and, and the, Leip the Leipzig data, this youth data, shows a collapse of support for East Germany at a very ironic point, just at the point where Honecker made his state visit to West Berlin, to West Germany, to Helmut Kohl and stuff. And you would think, and Honecker thought, that this was the high point because the uh, basic treaty had only de facto recognized, for those of you who don't have that detail, East Germany, and had not de jure recognized the country, okay? And Kohl, when Honecker came, still, you know, said something about in the toast and so on about a possible unification in the future. And Honecker chose to ignore it because his being received as a head of state and so on meant symbolically that East Germany had been recognized also in a symbolic way, not just, you know, uh, um, de facto. So this is a kind of complicated background. And the data is that, um, you know, it's the uh, virtual emigration through TV and radio for four-fifths of the area of the GDR every evening uh, in the West German media that had made them virtual participants of West German politics, although not, you know, de facto, but, you know, the, it's the same language, you know, and they were watching Western news, you know, because... Uh, it was more factual and more reliable and so on than the stuff that they got fed by their own Aktuelle Kamera. Uh, and so they had already allegiances to Helmut Kohl or Willy Brandt or various other West German politicians established. You know. uh, and you know, while they were critical of you know, some things, you know, um, you know, public disturbances in the West or whatever, you know, or, you know, and there was Eastern propaganda about Western crime and Western unemployment and so on. And that, you know, also influenced people. I mean, it didn't just sort of run off completely, but, you know, on balance, you know, they trusted the Western institutions more than their own. I mean, that would be the first point. Uh, the second point with their own institutions, um, the, uh, the dissidents wanted a reform of the GDR. They were looking for what I have called the third way, you know, uh, in, in one of the things that I've written. Uh, and interestingly enough, they also agreed with the party reformers on this, and that's what made the round table work, because, you know, those two different groups were together uh, by and large. Uh, it is um, the Social Democrats in the East that were the first group that wanted um, free elections, you know, and that really were, you know, trying to compete with the, with the ruling party. So the project is, first of all, one of renewal of the GDR through uh, regaining human rights, free speech, free assembly, and so on. And that happens on the 9th of October uh, in Leipzig and in the weeks thereafter. 
But part of this then is the travel policy. And it is then the mistaken announcement on November 9th and so on by Schabowski, which gets, you know, this one, which, you know, uh, leads to the fall of the wall. And we have data that tracks that. And until a week or so after the fall of the wall, it is the reform of the GDR that most everybody wants. And then, you know, with this time delay, the issue of unification comes up and rises, you know. And eventually, by the end of November, by the Cole's 10-point plan on the November 28th or whenever that was, you know, it, it begins to overtake the issue of, of renewing the GDR. You know, and in the background, of course, was also the attitude towards the Soviet Union, um, which had changed somewhat. I mean, you know, there were various kinds of uh, uh, popular epithets like the friends, in quotation mark, and so on, you know, their goes of the big brother, you know, and so on, you know, by which the, the Russians were called. And of course, you have a kind of a fundamental uh, disparity between a set of memories which have to do with liberation and the end of the Second World War, which for the majority of the German population have to do, you know, with death, uh, with uh, pillage, and with rape, you know, especially for the women and, you know, their. You know, people talk about a couple million, you know, of those, you know. So, I mean, it's obviously nobody has a real mm -hmm. figure, you know, on that, and maybe it's only half that or whatever. But, I mean, you know, it's a, you know, and there are the appropriate kinds of jokes. So you have a kind of popular memory of traumatic conquest, and you have a publicly institutionalized memory of liberation and of owing, you know, the victorious Red Army your freedom, which of course is in Trepto. I don't know if you've ever visited that. There's a big memorial, and the tank outside of the, you know, uh, of, of the Bundestag, you know, is also uh, the Reichstag building and stuff, you know, is from there. So that you have, you know, fundamentally polarized and mixed attitudes. For the party members, you know, learning from the Soviet Union means to learn how to win, was the slogan, you know. Uh, and, you know, and there were intellectuals also that had, you know, uh, admiration for Russian high culture, you know, 19th century Russian <coughs> culture, you know, Russian music, l Russian literature. There was a German-Soviet Friendship Society. If you were not in the party, that was a good thing to be a member of because it didn't really hurt very much, you know, and maybe you could travel, you know, <laughs> you know somewhere in the Soviet Union and so on. So, you know, and, and then there is the practical experience of any number of uh, delegationen, you know, you were always sent in delegation, you know, to another factory or whatever, you know, where you would have to drink endless amounts of vodka, you know, with your Russian peers, you know, you know until you fell under the table and stuff, and where the East Germans then would inevitably come back and feel good about East Germany because <laughs> their standard of living was higher, <laughs> their factories functioned better than the ones in Russia, you know, and you name it, you know. So what you have is what I was trying to sketch here on the Russian side was a set of rather mixed feelings, you know. Uh, and with the Gorbachev stuff, the thing then turns around completely because it is suddenly Russia that is more liberal and it's reforming communism, you know, or at least trying to, and it's the own regime, you know, that is the Stalinist regime, you know. And, you know, then, you know, you get into a predicament, you know, where, where Gorbachev gets cheered during the 40th anniversary, you know, and the, and the leadership itself, you know, is, is not, you know, and people shout, Gorby, 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 you know, and they don't shout, Erich, Erich, Erich. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, you know, I mean, it has both to do with, you know, structures of this that are determined, and then it has to do with change over time. As, uh, you know, space gets recaptured, things can be said out in the open that can't be said before, you know. And that's why I once looked at the programs, you know, for the, of the dissident groups and so on, and, you know, if you look, unification doesn't appear. In the founding, in the founding proposals, the new forum all talks about a dialogue or whatever, you know. And it takes, you know, uh, until uh, around Christmas, before the first groups talk about unification, you know, among the dissidents. And it is really the, the silent majority, you know, the general population, which is out ahead of it because they switch from, you know, wir sind das Volk, we are the people, to wir sind ein Volk, we are one people. You know, and that switch happens in November after the fall of the wall. 
Well, we're well over our time. It's a credit to you, Conrad, that there have been hardly any defections at all. <laughs> thank you so much for a very learned afternoon. So thank you. Thank you for having me.